can deal with this guy's issue later. Hopefully everyone is here. Um, there's only a couple of you here, but I think we'll make a bit of a start. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. My name's Kate Madden and I'm a research agronomist with the Birch of Cropping Group. Uh, just before we get into it properly, I just recommend that it would be great if everybody could mute yourself. That would be really helpful. Um, if you've got any questions at all while we're going, if you look down on your toolbar, there should be a little Q&A thing there. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free just to pop them in there and I'll be able to see them and I'll answer them as I go. If you want, you have got the option to ask them anonymously, um, but just remember there's no such thing as a silly question at all. Um, another thing you can do is if you've got a question, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, that way I can answer it or anyone else who is participating in this webinar um, can answer it um, and there's also you should have a raise your hand option um, I'll be monitoring that as well um, and then yeah that's another way if you've got a question I can make sure that I see it we will have time for questions at the end however so if you've got anything that you're not sure about or anything that you'd like more information about yeah feel free to save it for the end and I'll answer it then um, I would also like to add that this webinar is being recorded. Um, no one will be able to see your face, um, but it is just being recorded. That also means that it will be available afterwards. So if you need to leave at any point or for any reason, feel free to do so and I'll send the recording through afterwards. Um, so what we'll be talking about today is I'll give a quick introduction to soil carbon and what that's all about. Given that this webinar is a part of the Wimmera CMA's Building Carbon and Capacity Project, um, so this webinar itself is supported by the Wimmera Catchment Management Authority through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Um, I'll then give you an introduction to the soil carbon trial we've been running at Lubeck um, in 2019 and it's going again this year. And I'll also give a brief introduction to the trial at Netherby that we're running um, that was shown this year. Um, I'll quickly cover off on some key learnings about what BCG and what I've learned from these trials and I'll also touch on things to consider if you're planning on deep ripping, claying or manuring. And then finally we'll get round to any questions if anyone's got any at the end. So we'll jump straight into it. There's still not many people here but hopefully they'll join in later. Um, so starting with an introduction to soil carbon. So the key to soil carbon or the initial starting point for soil carbon is plant biomass. So what I mean by plant biomass is, as you can see, I'll just put my little duvalecki on. Is, so we grow the crop um, and then in December or whenever you harvest it, you come along and you take the grain off, but we leave the stubble behind. So then eventually, as you'd all be aware, the stubble slowly drops down and sits on the soil. So all of it's plant biomass, but what's important for soil carbon is the plant biomass that's left behind. Um, so plant biomass then becomes soil organic matter. So this is just the plant biomass that's broken down and it makes it into the soil. So soil organic matter is really important, um, especially in cropping systems, because it contains a lot of our nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, um, nutrients for the crop, as well as carbon. So when people talk about soil organic carbon, that's just the part of the soil organic matter that is carbon. It's the part of the plant that was once the starch or the sugar that's now sitting in the soil. And then Soil organic carbon forms two main types. There's a particulate organic carbon, which is just any of the little bits of plants that are bigger than two mil. And these tend to flux in and out. So quite often this is stuff that's quite vulnerable to erosion um, and changes quite a lot depending on how much biomass you grow each year. The other form is humus. And humus is the really, really fine small bits of soil organic carbon. So it's 
the stuff that binds around your soil particle. Um, it contains a lot of nutrients. It's great for structure and helps to promote soil stability. It sort of clumps things together. So humus is and particulate organic carbon are the two main forms of organic carbon we'll see. The third form is what we call char or charcoal, and that's just carbon that isn't available to the plant at all. It just sort of sits in the soil doing not much. So those two forms, particulate organic carbon, humus and char, are what make up what's called your soil organic carbon. And your soil organic organic carbon is just part of soil organic matter, which is the little bits of plants that have broken down over time. So when you're considering your own paddock, the amount of soil carbon depends on, so what your starting level is, plus your gains, minus what you lose each year. So starting level is heavily determined by soil type and rainfall. Um, and if you're considering today as starting day one, what's your starting level? Past management practices will have had an influence as well. How you can increase your soil carbon is by increasing your plant biomass that can eventually be broken down. So there's lots of different management practices you can put into play here. And your losses are your erosion, nutritional tie up, and the nutrients that are taken out of the stubble by the plants. Uh, out of the ground by the plants, I'm sorry. So when you start to factor all these in, BCG decided that for its building carbon and capacity project with Wimber CMA, what we'd look at doing is looking at key ways that we can ameliorate soil to try and get rid of some of these key constraints that are pre preventing the paddocks from growing as much biomass as they could. The side effect of this is that when you grow more biomass, you also tend to have higher yields, um, and it's just generally all around better. Um, so as part of this program, we're running two trials. Um, there's a trial at Netherby, which is in between Rainbow and Nil, up there by Lake Hindmarsh. Um, and then there's another trial at Lubeck, which is in between Rapanyip and Stoll. So to start off, I'll start by talking about the Lubeck trial, um, and then I'll move on to the Netherby trial. Just highlight it down there. Um, so Lubeck annual rainfall is 560 millimetres with a growing season rainfall of about 380. And the soil type that this trial is located on is a wall, what is locally known as a wall wall sand. Um, it's quite gravelly, it's quite coarse, it looks like washed riverbed sand. Um, and then it's over clay. There is clay soil but it's quite deep. So the key constraints to being able to buy, grow more biomass in this area was the low water holding capacity and the really hard compacted sand that prevented plant establishment and also prevented root growth. Um, so this trial started in 2019. Um, so we've sowed it last year, we'll sow it this year, and then it'll be sown for three more years. So the important thing to consider about today's webinar is this is just the first lot of data. In five years time, hopefully I'll have all the answers, but at this point, there's still a lot of questions that I'm looking forward to figuring out the answers to. So just a bit of a brief overview and introduction to the site. Um, so as you can see, these are um, a soil pit that we dug on the site to have a better understanding of the soil. Um, and it's also got a photo of a dog in it, which sometimes can be helpful with an audience. Um, it's quite coarse. Um, and as you can see with those orange um, lines moving through there, um, there is clay, but it's quite deep down. Um, and it's one of the only soil types I've seen where when you take a core, um, it's that loose, there's not enough moisture in it to stick it together at all, um, but it's that coarse, you actually have to drill it back out because it won't run. Um, so yeah, I think the best way to describe it would be a sort of a washed river sand. It's very grainy, very coarse, and it's been packed down over time. So what we did was we tried deep ripping it um, with this Grizzly Deep Ripper. Um, it was about 30, ripped to about a depth of 35 centimetres. I did this quite early on in the season, um, in, on the 26th of March last year. Um, as you can see, this is just a straight shank. Um, and while it had points on the bottom of the time, they weren't particularly wide as these, this river, deep ripper had been used a lot prior to ripping the trial. The other treatments involved in the Lubeck trial, um, we had clay spreading at two different rates, as you can see us there shoveling the clay out of the JCB. 
Um, so clay was spread at 200 tonnes per hectare and 300 tonnes per hectare, kind of in line with what other farmers were growing, doing in the district. Um, we spread chicken manure at 20 tonnes per hectare and I'll touch a little bit more on that later. And we also spread, uh, used a KMAG fertiliser blend at 10 kilograms per hectare down the fert boot at seeding. Um, this is because the year before we had tissue tests showing that the, cal the potassium magnesium ratios were really out um, and the plants were quite deficient in magnesium. Um, but we didn't see a lot of results from this fertiliser blend so I won't talk about it much more other than to say it was in the trial and we didn't see great results. Um, so something that's important to note is that we spread our clay and our manure on the 6th of June and we then sowed straight into it the next day on the 7th of June to set the wheat. So the manure we applied was a chicken manure with rice hull bedding. Um, when we applied it at 20 tonnes per hectare, which was the equivalent of putting out 57 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen, 78 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus, 82 kilograms per hectare of sulphur, 400 kilograms per hectare of potassium, and one kilogram per hectare of zinc. So overall, I'd say that this is, um, it's one of those things where it's very hard to judge. Um, so we basically threw a lot of nutrients at the plots that got the chicken manure treatments. However, it is just a cautionary note that it always pays to get your manures tested prior to spreading. Um, we found that we have ended up applying um, sodium, which is a salt at 108 kilograms per hectare, which is a lot higher than you'd like, especially if you're on a salty soil that already has salinity issues. And we also put out boron at one kilogram per hectare. Now plants need boron to grow. However, in certain areas, um, probably more around bird chip, um, you do see problems with boron toxicity. So if you were having these kinds of soil type, you wouldn't want to be putting more boron in on top. And this is just a bit of a general site picture um, taking about August last, uh, October last year, sorry, things are out in head. Um, so it's quite flat, we don't see a lot. It's a slight rise for the rest of the paddock, um, but yeah. So moving on into the results that we saw last year, so 2019. Um, we struggled a lot with establishment at this site. So we spread it on the 6th of June, we sowed it on the 7th of June, and then in the next week, it got 35 mil of rain on it. Um, and this ended up in that we saw, especially in our clay plots, but in a lot of other plots, um, as you can see from these photos, that the clay plots, the furrows slumped back over, um, which really damaged our establishment. Um, I'll just take a moment to touch on how this worked. Um, so if you see that photo of the little cedar combine Jiggy there. Um, so the, we're looking at this from a similar point of view, except for we're looking at the back of BCG's um, little plot cedar. As, so we've give me two seconds. Um, so these are the back two tyres. Here you've got your six, six tines, and um, that's just the gang that holds your tines onto your cedar. And then due to the way nature of how we had to spread the pl clay pots by hand, what we ended up seeing was that the clay sort of slumped away to the edges of the plots while where we spread it in the middle of the plot, um, it remained at the depth we spread it. So you saw these curved plots um, developing where we'd spread clay. Um. So what happens is then you come along and we sow the seed, um, which of course led to the seed being a step sown at quite variable depths, as you can see there. The ones towards the edges of the plots were fine. Um, the ones in the middle of the plots were sown deep um, and they had a much deeper furrow as well. So when we got the rain um, in the week prior to, week directly following sowing, um, what we saw was that all the furrows had slumped back in. Um, so this then meant that this crops really struggled to come up as anything that was sown too deep in a deeper part of the um, plot struggled to come up, hence why they all went yellow and died. But anything that was on the edges um, got through, did not too badly, um, but it was still struggling quite a bit. 
Another issue we saw with the furrow slumping in was that prior to time we'd put out an emergence of Secura, um, just at label rate 118 grams per hectare. So what happens in a prep soil sowing system is that you um, you spray before you, s and this was a PSP application. Um, so what we did was we sprayed before we sprayed before we sowed, um, and then as you sowed through it, the tines pushed the soil up and out of the furrow, leaving it sitting away from the crop. Um, however, what happened when we um, Again, when we got the 35 mil of rain, is that the herbicide that was attached to the soil, um, as the soil slumped back in, so did the herbicide, um, which meant that another reason why those deeper sown crops struggled to come up through it was that where it had slumped in, not only were they coming up from a greater depth, but they were also trying to grow through the herbicide, which isn't ideal. So in the end, what we saw was that we had enough plot, we deemed that there was enough of an establishment to have a trial. However, we did see these very characteristic stripes or what's more colloquially known as footy socks, um, which indicates that the plants are struggling to come up from their depth. And typically this pinking um, and the colorfulness of it indicates that there's some herbicide damage there as well. Um, so not ideal. Um, and this was reflected in our establishment count. So I've got the data up here um, and everything I put out today will be displayed with um, significant difference letters. So any of anywhere where there's a letter, that means that statistically, so this, so this H here, that means that statistically that's the same as any of the other treatments that have a H. Or if you've got, uh, if we pick this one here that's got A and B, that means that that's statistically the same as everything else that has an A or anything else that has a B. Um, the error bars I've chosen to display are standard deviations, which will hopefully give you a bit of a feel for how variable the trial was. So as we saw, um, the best treatments were those that didn't have clay applied. Um, so control, manure, manure and magnesium together, magnesium. We saw the establishment begin to slip away um, as soon as we had any clay involved whatsoever. Um, and it's important to note that um, so 140 is the targeted establishment we sowed this trial at um, and we only really saw two treatments get close um, and then it fell away. Um, I will present harvest data later with yield um, and it's important to note that establishment wasn't correlated with yield um, so I won't talk about much further. As a treatment as the trial moved on, we did see how there were quite significant differences in biomass. Um, and this was highlighted in the chicken manure treatments, which is probably due to the extra nutrition it received before when I was talking about all the extra NMP that this, these plots received. Um, we saw that the clay were a little bit stunted, probably due to coming out from depth. Um, and this, so what we're looking at here is the treatment that wasn't ripped. Um, and for anyone with good eyes, you can see that we had a problem with cutworm at this period, but we sprayed and the plants grew through it totally fine. Um, and we saw, again, similar um, trends in the root treatment. However, overall, the root treatment in terms of biomass was behind for most of the year. Uh, it never really caught up. Uh, we saw these trends still carrying through two months later when plants were beginning to sort of begin to fill the grain head down at the base of the stem. Uh, with manure still clearly leading the way um, and then the rest were pretty hard to split um, and we saw this trend again in the ripped treatment. Uh, when it was in September we pulled some plants up same as the last set of photos I've showed you um, to compare the ripped and non-ripped and as I was saying before the ripped treatments um, were at a bit of a deficit to the controlled treatments all year. When we're looking at that biomass difference uh, over a plot scale, so these are the same three plots followed the whole way through the season. Uh, manure was off to an early start in the end of July, uh, it continued through into September with there generally not being much difference between the control plot and the clay. When it came out to head, 
Um, the manure still looked way better. The control fell behind a bit and the clay looked not too bad. And then just before we put the header over it, um, clear stand out with the manure plots. And then because building soil carbon is about how much starting sock or how much biomass you leave behind, as you can see, the manured plots had a lot more biomass left after the header had been over it than the root and the control plots. So these biomass differences they were also seen. Um, we put a drone up to measure NDVI um, and this was measured at that September stage when I had the photos from. Um, so clearly out in front was anything that had manure in it. Um, and this line here is just to point out the unripped control. So anything that's above that line you would consider has improved the amount of biomass at this growth stage um, and anything below the biomass below that line has decreased biomass from the control or we've made it worse than what it could have been. Um, so what we saw there was clay had a lot lower biomass probably due to the establishment while the manure had a lot higher biomass probably due to the increase in nutrients. But really what it matters what farmers care about at the end of the day is yield um, and how much extra you've been able to grow. Um, and we saw a pretty similar story to what we saw in the biomass was that the manure was out in front um, and the control was in the middle with anything clay coming in quite a bit later. Um, and same thing here, this is just sitting on the unripped control. So where have we improved yield? Uh, manure, manure clay, manure clay and clay magnesium, which probably indicates that there's a bit of a nutrient deficit at this site. Um, and the straight clays and the straight magnesium um, at the bottom yeah, made it worse. Just to highlight, um, as I was saying before about the treatments and the letters, these were the best two treatments by far. However, it's important to note that um, with looking at the stats, um, anything with an F is the same. So manure, manure clay, manure clay magnesium um, and clay magnesium are all statistically considered this having a similar result. There's no statistical difference between them. However, if it was my odds on money, I would take the manure treatment. Um, growers also get paid on protein um, and it's a pretty important story to tell uh, so in the Wimmera 2019 was a pretty tight finish. Uh, we had a pretty good start, a wet winter, and then it sort of stopped raining. Um, so we had big bulky crops that tended to hit the wall pretty hard. So what I've done here is I've just put up the, so the lines represent the protein grades, so 10.5 to get you above APG, and the 13% to get you into H1. Um, there are only two treatments that made H1, and they were due, they had, both had manure applied, which is probably due to that extra 50 odd units of N applied at sowing. Um, and the ones that fell away back into APG, um, they were the ones that didn't have uh, nitrogen applied at sowing. Well, they were sown with starter fertilizer but, and were managed to be not nitrogen limited. However, that extra boost at the start for the manure must have made a difference in grain protein. Um, the other thing to consider is that a bulkier crop um, dries out faster and as we know uh, as crops tend to hay off um, grain protein increases um, and we definitely saw that this year. So what we saw was in the tight spring, spring finish with the low water holding capacity the crop hayed off quite badly um, with its greenings of 11% and a test weight of 74 both of which the screenings are higher and the test weight is lower than is what is needed to make most grains. So what we're looking at here is we've taken the average um, of every treatment in the plot that had every treatment in the trial that had manure applied and looked at the averages compared to the trial averages. And what we saw was that chicken manuring at a rate of 20 tonnes per hectare increased yields by 0.6 of a tonne um, and increased protein by 1.3%, which is probably due to the large amount of nitrogen these plots received. However, because it received a lot more nitrogen up front, um, these plots grew a lot more biomass and as a result used up their moisture earlier and hit the wall harder. So on top of already high 
On top of already 11% screenings, we saw that screenings increased a further 1.7% on average in the chicken manure plots and test rates fell back to around 72, um, showing that these crops hit the wall really hard in that tight spring. They hit off immensely, however, they did yield a lot more and had a higher grain protein, which could be suitable if you're aiming for a livestock feed market. Um, clay was where we saw some really interesting results. Um, we didn't see a yield increase or a yield decrease when we applied clay at either 200 or 300 tonnes per hectare. However, we did see a decline plant establishment. So there was about 50 plants per metre squared less in the clay plots. However, this lack of plants didn't result in a lack of yield. Um, this could potentially be because the plants were able to tiller out a bit better or there was some other compensatory factor going on. Um, and this is a time when I'm really grateful that this is a five year trial. Uh, I've got a few more years to come up with the answers as to why we might have seen this. Um, another, and then however, this is compared to deep ripping. Um, and on this soil type in this year, the results for deep ripping weren't good at all. Um, so we established less plants, about 35 meters per square, met, per, plants per square meter less. Um, and we also decreased yield by 0.4 of a tonne um, compared to the trial average. Um, however, we also saw that screenings increased and test weight decreased again, meaning that we obviously the plants were still hanging off. They hate off harder than the rest of the trial, um, but not as hard as the manure plots. But what this shows is that we were hoping that by deep ripping it and opening these compacted sands up, they'd be able to increase their rooting depth get down and act, be able to access more water. Um, and the fact that they appear to have hate off harder than most of the other plots in the trial indicates that maybe this wasn't the case. Um, and this trial highlights the importance of really understanding your soil type before you deep rip. And it also shows that you won't get a yield response to deep ripping on every soil type. And this is a really important point to remember. If you're considering deep ripping, generally deep ripping works best on clay over sand soils where you're able to bring some of that clay up to increase your water holding capacity and break up a hard compacted layer. Um, the problem with this soil type is that it's pretty much gravelly clay, uh, gravelly sand, sorry, um, to about 50 or 60 centimetres. Um, it's quite packed or compressed the whole way down um, and generally deep ripping hasn't been the answer for us here. Um, so with the Lubeck trial in 2020, we thought we were under a really good thing. Um, we sowed it to Canola 44Y90, um, the 23rd of April, spot on sowing time, got some rain to wash it in. However, then we saw this. Um, and what we saw was that basically we didn't have enough Canola plants up to make it a trial. What we saw was that it came up where we'd interro sowed from last year's crop. Um, while the interro fell back over on a wheel track, um, which is where we saw that we got the most plants up. The reason why we don't think we established a good stand of canola here is just due to depth. Um, with the variable seeding depth in these plots that I explained earlier, um, the canola just couldn't handle coming up from a bit deeper down um, and therefore didn't emerge or establish. So what we decided to do was that we resowed the whole child to chickpeas on the 4th of June and um, they're just starting to come up and hopefully it means that we'll have a lot better trial site um, and a lot better trial results this year. Um, and now on to the second trial of soil amelioration to build soil carbon that BCG is working on and this one's the Netherby trial. Um, the trial site's located north of Nil and south west of Rainbow um, and it's not a totally different soil type. I'll just explain a little bit more about the trial site here. Um, so the annual rainfall at Netherby is 360 mil with the growing season rainfall of 240 mil. Um, and just for some context, uh, the Lubeck site has a higher growing season rainfall than Netherby's annual rainfall. Um, it's a lot drier up there. The soil type is so sand over clay, um, but in this case, the sand's a lot shallower. Uh, it's only about 20 centimetres deep, um, which means it will be able to be brought up when we deep rip. Um, the key constraints at this trial site was that it's got a hard setting to clay pan not very far down, and the sand on top is non-wetting. So it means that the plants struggle to get enough moisture around the seed to germinate, 
And then even if they do germinate and put their roots down, they struggle to get their roots down very deep because of this hard clay pan, which means that essentially they're trying to grow in about 30 centimetres of soil. And again, the water holding capacity because their root depth is so limited is quite low. Um, this trial was started in 2020, so this year is the first year that we've sown it. Um, and I'd just like to take a quick moment to mention our partners in this trial, Western Ag, um, they've been really invaluable in making this trial happen for us. Um, they've provided support um, and it's really been helpful to have them on board with this. And these are just a couple of pictures of the site to give you a bit of a background. Um, these aren't the amelioration trial. However, it just shows you the sort of colour of the sand um, and what we're working with here. Um, so ripping details. Um, it was ripped between 30 and 40 centimetres deep um, with, rip, with the time space a lot closer than they were at Lubeck, so 300 mil spacing. Um, it was ripped in early March. Uh, the treatments in this trial were clay spreading again at two rates, 100 tonnes per hectare and 200 tonnes per hectare. Um, and in, in this trial, because we were seeing such promising results with the manure spreading at Lubeck, um, we included some manure spreading rates at 5, 10 and 20 tonnes per hectare. And we also included three treatments where we balanced just nitrogen and phosphorus um, at each rate and that was applied as triple superphosphate with urea to top the NUP. And learning from our mistakes last year, we spread the clay and the manure on the 14th of April, um, allowed it to get a rain on it and then sowed it to, May, sowed it to septa wheat 25th of May, which is spot on district swimming time for that variety in that area. Um, the manure was different again, um, as most people watching this would be aware, um, your manure is different for pretty much every source you've got. Um, so what we saw was that nitrate and nitrogen was a fair bit lower than the Lubeck. Um, phosphorus was still quite high and potassium was also high, but nowhere near as high as it was at the Lubeck site. Um, so just to touch on at 20 tonnes per hectare, we were putting out 51 kilos of nitrogen per, he per hectare, 97 kilograms of phosphorus, nearly 200 kilos of potassium, 73 kilos per hectare of sulfur and 3 kilos per hectare of zinc. And obviously the nutrients um, and the amount of nutrients available to the plants in these manure plots is quite high. Um, so that's why we were interested to balance the, balance the nutrients out to see if there was something else in the manure or if it was just an NMP response which farmers could actually use synthetic fertilizers instead um, that are a lot logistically easier to manage. Um, so the crop last time I was at the site the 11th of June was just coming up um, so I haven't got any establishment data for you. Um, again we're seeing a bit of a striping um, which is probably due to, due to the fact that, again, we struggled a little bit with depths this year. Nowhere near as bad as at the Lubeck site, so I'm expecting that we'll have a much better establishment there. Um, and hopefully in the next week or two, we'll have solid establishment data. Um, so the key learnings that we've had from being able, from undertaking these trials and getting our heads around soil amelioration um, is that the key issue is how do you manage to establish a crop um, and the key levers we've got to try and improve this um, is to pick the right crop type to handle sowing depth. As we found out at Lubeck this year, canola just can't do it. Um, and pulses are better at it than cereals. So if you think you're going to struggle, consider putting in a pulse um, the first year after you've deep ripped or you've played. Um, and getting sowing depth right is the other half to establishing. Um, so remember when you're choosing your sowing depth, especially if there's rain on the forecast to account for how much your furrows might slump back in. Um, and it's also important to check your cedar properly and get it set up so it's sowing at the optimum depth, which for cereals is probably around three centimetres most years, pulses three to five, canola one, um, which will be different for every cedar, so I'm not going to give any suggestions as to how to do it other than get out of the tractor cab, go and have a bit of a scratch around and see how deep you are putting it out at. Um, it's important to know what you're putting on your paddock. Um, so every manure, manure source is different. Um, at BCG I'm lucky enough to send quite a few of them off for sampling and see the results back. 
um, and every single one of them has been different and would have had different effects if you'd spread it on your paddock. Um, and I'd also start thinking about, yeah, we've seen great results, but are you actually creating more problems that you'll have to deal with down the track? Um, so as we saw last year, if you're putting too much out, especially manure that's high in nitrogen, you are risking hanging off the crop. Um, in, in the Lubeck manure, we saw that there were higher levels in, in salt and borum than is ideal. Um, and at Netherby, we saw something where after we spread the clay, we got an opening rain. Um, and funnily enough, in all of our clay plots, we had ryegrass come up. Um, so the unclayed plots didn't have a blade of ryegrass in them. Um, and the only thing we can put it down to is that the clay that we spread must have been contaminated with ryegrass. So it's important to consider factors to ensure that you're not making yourself another problem. Um, the other thing that we've learned a lot about with is how to work better with herbicides. Um, we know that bare soil, because it has less organic matter, it makes herbicides hotter. There's less them to bind to so that they're a lot more mobile and a lot more at risk of injuring the plant. Um, you again with the furrows slumping back in, you risk a or risk an even lower establishment if you have herbicides that wash back in. Um, something that caused us some questions this year when we resowed the Lubeck site is if we need to resow, what options are there with plant back periods? Um, we were lucky that we could go with chickpeas, um, but the fact that we had propizomide in our brew and we wanted to sow back over it only a month or two after we'd sprayed it ruled out a lot of options for us. Um, and this was further compacted by the fact that we had a Roundup ready canola in, which meant that we couldn't use um, Roundup to knock it down. Um, and if you're claying or deep ripping, how, how are the weed seeds moving? Are you burying them, meaning that they won't be a problem, or are you bringing some of them up closer to the surface? Um, so if you're considering deep ripping, manuring or clay spreading on some farm. Here's just some general bit of uh, some general tips um, to have a bit of a think about. Um, so I'd recommend that number one is understand the specific constraint first. What is the actual problem you're dealing with here? Um, there's no good saying, oh that patch over there doesn't grow very much. It's important to know why. Is it that the sands are non wetting? Have you got compacted layers? Is there just no water holding capacity there? Have you got nutrient deficiencies? Is there a pH problem? Is it salinity? Is it root disease? Is it a herb, old herbicide residue? Um, and these are just off the top of my head. There's so many more things that stop crops from growing. So not every technique will fix every problem. As a matter of fact, most techniques only fix one or two problems. Um, so it's really important to understand what's the actual root cause that's going on here. Um, and part of knowing what the problem is, is to understand what soil type you're working with. So I'd recommend strongly getting soil tests done, um, or even better, dig a hole, get out of the ute with a shovel and dig as deep as you can to work out, have you got layers of clay there? Is it a compaction layer? Is it sand? Is it the same soil type the whole way through? Um, or even better, if you can dig a soil pit that gets you right at depth, you can look at the whole rooting zone um, and that will help you to get a better understanding of not only the soil but what's going wrong and how you can fix it. Um, and again, not every technique works on every soil type, especially deep ripping. Um, so if you've got anything nasty um, under the surface that's preventing your crop from growing, so sedicity or um, acidity, if you deep rip and bring it up, you could actually be doing a lot more damage than if you just let it settle, left it settled down there. Um, something that BCG has been fortunate enough to do is to learn from other people's mistakes. Um, so if you're considering it, think about has anyone in the district done before? Has there been research done in the area before? Um, and go and talk to people who've done it on their own farms. They're probably able to give you a fair bit of a head start in telling you what not to do and what works best for them. Um, and I'd also recommend talking to your agronomist. Um, they will probably have seen it more broadly. I would also recommend that you get everything tested. Um, so if you're testing, if you're going to deep rip, test the soils um, 
to see what you could be bringing up. So acidity, salinity and sadistity. Um, if you're looking at deep ripping to increase water holding capacity by bringing clay up, you can get tested for clay content. Um, and I would also recommend that if you're doing soil testing that you, for deep ripping to do it in quite specific little increments, so 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. Um, that'll help you understand what depth you need to rip at um, to be able to bring clay up if it's there, if that's what your aim is. Um, and I'd also, if you're testing manure, make sure you understand the nutrient level, um, how much N and P are in it, and also to make sure there's no surprises like salt or boron. Um, and some, most labs will also test for heavy metals to make sure you're not going to be spreading something that has a proper toxicity. Something else to consider is when to do it. Um, so something we struggled with last year at the Lubeck trial was that we spread it and then we sewed back into it the day after so it didn't have any chance to settle down at all. Everything was still incredibly loose, which made it more likely to slump. Um, so consider how early on you want to rip it or clay it before sewing. Um, and part of that will depend on which crop type you're choosing to sew back into it. Um, However, the trade-off is that the earlier you deep rip or clay spread, the more chance you've got of um, wind erosion um, and time before sowing. Sorry. Um, and I'd also recommend that before you rush out and um, deep rip or clay spread or manure, think about where you are in your rotation. Um, so obviously if you're in a pretty set rotation um, to manage disease issues or to manage um, weeds, I wouldn't rip paddocks that you're planning on putting canola into. Um, I'd either change the rotation or put off deep ripping it um, due to the establishment risks. Um, consider which herbicide residues are present. Um, so there's not a lot known about how claying and deep ripping affects persistence, but there are people who think that if you deep rip or, or clay and you bury any residues that are on the surface, it might take them longer to break down, which means that they could be an issue for even longer. Um, and I'd also consider the weed levels in the paddock. So if there's a lot of weed seed there, are you potentially burying it, meaning it'll be a problem for more years as it slowly works its way up? And are you in a position where if you're concerned about crop safety that you could potentially drop out some pre-emergent herbicides um, that'll give you a bit more chance to leave it longer, let the soil stable up, become more stable um, and sort of decrease that risk a bit. Um, and it might be a decision that you're backed into a corner to make if you have to sow the paddock and there's rain following up shortly after, which normally would be your ideal sowing situation. However, um, as we found out, the more it rains, the greater risk you've got of your furrows slumping back in. Um, I would also really strongly recommend starting small. Um, do your own trial patches or strips or part of a paddock to make sure that it works. Um, and use this time to work on how your machinery is set up, how deep are you ripping, how thick are you spreading your clay um, and have a bit of a play with all that. There's nothing, you wouldn't want to go out and deep rip a paddock, a whole paddock only to find out that you weren't actually improving the problems you were trying to fix. Um, so I would recommend the year before um, you want to do a major part to just do a small part. Um, and I'd also consider if you need to take a broad spectrum approach and deep rip or clay whole paddocks or whether you'd better off just spending your time targeting specific areas, the worst parts of paddocks, rather than doing the whole lot. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, if I've been monitoring the Q&A and there hasn't been any questions pop up um, and it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat. Um, does anyone have any questions? Doesn't appear so. Um, so with that in mind, I'll say 
I'd also like to say that I've just put my contact details up there if anyone's got any other questions um, that they'd like to get in touch with. Um, and I'll be emailing around a copy of the slides and the recording as soon as they're available. Um, but other than that, thank you very much to everyone for joining in. Um, I hope that you have all learned something today um, and thank you very much. Bye.